Silver diamine fluoride has been used in other countries for over 80 years as a caries arresting agent. Now in the United States, in 2014, the FDA actually approved silver diamine fluoride for use as a dentin hypersensitivity agent, specifically in patients over the age of 21. Basically it just kind of partially plugs those dentin tubules and helps reduce dentin hypersensitivity. Now, a lot of dentists are actually currently using silver diamine fluoride as an off-label use for the prevention and the ability to arrest dental caries. Now, it's very popular in pediatric populations and in adult populations. So currently, silver diamine fluoride is sold by a company called Elevate Oral Care, and they market it as a product called Advantage Arrest. So if you're interested in purchasing this product after this lecture, be sure to visit their uh, website for more information on the product. So some of the previous studies on silver diamine fluoride that look at its effectiveness have actually shown that it's very effective at arresting caries. And one specific study said it's actually effective in arresting over 90% of the lesions that's found in children when it's applied up to two times per year. Now other studies have actually said that silver diamine fluoride is even more effective than fluoride varnish, which we're commonly using for the prevention of dental caries. So what is silver diamine fluoride? Well, basically it's a colorless liquid that contains silver and fluoride as the main ingredients. Now, the company did state that even though it's colorless now, that they have plans to make it blue in the future. It's relatively inexpensive, it's very easy to use, um, it's painless for the patient, and it's very minimally invasive. Um, it's also uh, got a pH of 10, so it's a little bit more basic, it's not very acidic, and it normally comes in a concentration of 38%, and it also has a shelf life of three years. So the mechanism of action is really kind of what makes silver diamine fluoride so special. Now, we said it contains silver and it contains fluoride, but it also contains ammonia. And that ammonia helps to kind of stabilize those high concentrations of fluoride suspended in a water solution. Now, the fluoride, as you know from fluoride varnish, it helps to remineralize the tooth, helps to strengthen the tooth. But the silver content in this product actually is an antimicrobial and it helps kill bacteria that prevent the biofilm from actually forming on the tooth. So when you apply silver diamine fluoride to the tooth, it actually penetrates into the tooth. Uh, when we're talking about enamel, it penetrates up to 25 microns into the tooth. Uh, when we're talking about dentin, it actually penetrates up to 200 microns into dentin. So when it penetrates into the tooth, it actually helps increase resistance to acid that attacks the tooth. It helps inhibit breakdown of proteins in the dentin and it contains a very very high concentration of fluoride. So if we think about fluoride varnish, fluoride varnish has historically been the highest concentration of fluoride in a product that we actually use for our patients. 
and that's at 22,600 parts per million. Silver diamine fluoride has a fluoride concentration of 44,800 parts per million. So if you're thinking silver diamine fluoride sounds pretty amazing, you're probably wondering what are some of the indications for its use. The simple answer is you can pretty much use silver diamine fluoride for any carious lesion that you encounter. And remember, when you use it for a carious lesion, the goal is to actually arrest that carious lesion. Now, any Cambra model or caries management by risk assessment model that you're using to help treat patients that are high risk for caries, any model that you use can easily accommodate silver diamine fluoride as a treatment option. So if you think about what we've been doing for high caries risk patients, we typically use fluoride varnish. And the thing about fluoride varnish is it's really good at doing all the things we want fluoride to do, but it's not a great antimicrobial. So oftentimes with high caries risk patients, we actually need to put them on an antimicrobial rinse like chlorhexidine rinse to help kind of lower those bacterial counts in the mouth. Now the good thing about silver diamine fluoride is it actually has the benefits of both fluoride and an antimicrobial all packaged together in one product. Now most situations where there's actually a physical cavitation in the tooth and you use silver diamine fluoride, you're still probably going to want to restore that tooth at some point in the future. But silver diamine fluoride actually offers some really good advantages to specific situations where placement of a restoration could be a challenge. For example, if you have a patient that has some financial constraints, they can't afford to get a lot of treatment done, you can actually place silver diamine fluoride and that could actually help buy the patient some time and help prevent that carious lesion from getting worse over time. And hopefully, if you bought them some time, maybe it would prevent that from getting worse to the point to where it's gonna cause other bigger issues, like maybe the tooth would need a root canal eventually, or maybe it needs to be removed eventually. If you can prevent those things by using silver diamine fluoride, you're actually doing the patient a really good service. So another thing, aside from financial constraints, could be time constraints. Because sometimes you have patients that they need a lot of treatment done. Maybe they have a ton of restorations in the mouth. And you know it's going to take a while to get through all those restorations. And it's going to take a lot of time. So if you use silver diamine fluoride on some of these patients that you know it's going to take a long time to do their treatment, you can actually prevent some of those lesions again from getting worse and potentially leading to other things like root canal procedures, extractions, you know, potential need for posts and cores later, subsequent crowns, etc. Silver diamine fluoride's actually been shown to be very beneficial for helping to treat those carious lesions that are very hard to get to or have very difficult access, like lesions on root surfaces or infurcations or like in the distal of a second molar, those areas that's very hard to get to, silver diamine fluoride can be very beneficial. It's also been uh, very useful in those situations where you're, perhaps you're gonna do partial caries removal or you're gonna use stepwise caries removal. And in those situations, you can actually use the silver diamine fluoride as an indirect pulp cap material. It will actually arrest that caries that is left on the floor above that pulp chamber and that allows you to not only arrest the lesion, but you can you know, rest assured that you're not going to have that pulp exposure. And as long as you put a good sealed restoration in there, you could really place that silver diamine fluoride and then put a definitive restoration right on top of that. So in some pediatric uh, dentistry populations, you know, some of the children that, that come in there may have behavior problems. They can be very difficult to treat. If they have a lot of work that needs to be done, you know, oftentimes the pediatric dentist or the, the dentist who's treating them will actually decide to either sedate the child or to take the child to the operating room. So silver diamine fluoride in those cases could be actually very beneficial because maybe that could be a treatment option for that child who has behavior issues or for that child who may need to go to the operating room. It could be a good minimally invasive alternative to those more riskier treatment options. 
And you know, not just for pediatric patients, not just for those difficult pediatric patients or those behavior patients that you know this may be good for, but think about your adult population as well. The adult patients that have like high anxiety, the ones who are dental phobics, I mean, this is very minimally invasive. It really doesn't require much at all on your part. Could cause a little bit of mild sensitivity initially, but the patients should do really well with this. And that could be a really good treatment option for those kind of patients. Not to mention perhaps patients that are medically compromised, the ones who it's a little bit riskier to do the more invasive procedures. Silver diamine fluoride can be very beneficial in those populations as well. If those are some of the indications for actually using silver diamine fluoride, what are some of the contraindications? Well, thankfully, there's really not that many contraindications. Probably the biggest one is because the product contains silver, if you have a patient that has a true silver allergy, that would be an absolute contraindication to its use. And you know, that's not to be confused with a nickel allergy, which is something that patients can commonly maybe confuse and they, they may think they have a silver allergy, but in fact, it's really a nickel allergy. Now, another contraindication, um, it's really more of a relative contraindication, but if a patient presents with ulcerations or sores in the mouth, you know, you may not want to use this product at that time on the patient. You know, it could basically potentially cause some irritation to those sores, those um, areas that the ulcerations are at. It's, it's really kind of an irritant to the gingiva in general. But, you know, if that's the case, you can actually take petroleum jelly, Vaseline, just put that over the ulceration, and that helps prevent contact with those areas and really spares the patient any kind of discomfort or pain if that contact does occur. So you want to use this product on your patient. What do you need to do? Well, the product actually comes in two different forms. One form is a 8 milliliter bottle, so it's a pretty decent sized bottle or you can actually purchase it in a unit dose form. Now, there isn't really any good strong recommendations for how often or what the frequency of application should be for resting caries, but a lot of providers in the literature that I've actually read, it seems like the general recommendation is to apply it every six months. Now, the manufacturer actually says that you can apply this more frequently but at a minimum, you should have at least a week in between the applications. So because silver diamine fluoride is an irritant to the gingiva, you may want to consider using like petroleum jelly on the gingiva around the teeth you're going to work on. The other thing is just having really good isolation. So use cotton rolls, you know, dry angles. You could even consider using a rubber dam uh, when placing that product. Now, the other thing too is you know, you don't have to do anything to the tooth or to the lesion itself. You don't have to remove the caries. You can leave it in place. So that's a very attractive feature for its use. Basically, just clean the tooth, dry the tooth off before you apply the silver diamine fluoride, and place a small amount of that material onto the actual carious area of the tooth. And they actually come with uh, little micro sponges, you could probably use a micro brush as well, um, but the company actually sells specific micro sponges to use with that product. So one drop of the product is supposedly enough to treat up to one to five teeth. And according to the manufacturer, after you apply it, you really need to let that air dry for at least 60 seconds. And then if there's any excess, you can just remove that with a two by two or with a cotton roll. So at any time after you place silver diamine fluoride, you may decide that you want to actually place a restoration in that curious lesion. And that's perfectly fine. And honestly, if the tooth's cavitated, it's not a bad idea to place a restoration anyway. Well, one of the good things about using silver diamine fluoride is there's really no contraindications for what materials you can use later to restore the tooth. You can use whatever you like, glass ionomer, resin modified glass ionomer, composite, amalgam, what have you. Now keep in mind that if you don't entirely excavate that area that you treated, 
some of the staining that occurs from this product can actually be left behind if you don't remove that when you do your preparation for your restoration. And that could be a problem for aesthetics. It could be a problem for future providers that look at this because some of that staining that's left could inadvertently be confused for caries. And if it's in the aesthetic zone, it could be very unacceptable to the patient if they see that. So some of the side effects of this product, uh, thankfully there's only a few side effects really. Um, most of them are, are nothing really to worry about. The biggest one I've already mentioned, and that's the staining that it causes on the carious lesion. Now the nice thing is it does not stain intact enamel, intact dentin. So if the tooth's in good shape, it's not going to stain that. It's only going to stain those areas where you have infected or affected dentin. And, you know, the staining itself, <clears throat> you know, it occurs pretty quickly. It probably gets worse over the next few days after the application. But it can also stain tissue. If it touches the gingiva, it can stain the tissue. You know, with the turnover of the epithelium, that, that staining will go away in time if it contacts the tissue. If you have composite restorations near where you're placing this, and you have a little bit of flash or you don't have really smooth margins, it could um, actually stain the margins of those composites, so that could be an issue for you. But most of the time you could just buff that out with some polishing points, and it's not gonna be a big issue if it does stain those composites. But this stuff stains everything, potentially, okay? Um, it can stain your skin, it can stain countertops, it can stain clothing, it can stain instruments. So when you're using this, you really need to be careful and you really need to be mindful of what you're doing because you don't want to just slap this stuff on and be making a mess because it could stain just about everything that it touches. So once it contacts the, the carious lesion, it's possible that the patient could have a temporary sensitivity or a temporary pain with the tooth in some cases. If it contacts the gingiva, you know, it can be an irritation to the gingiva. And really, you should just try to avoid that at all cost. You know, that's why you want to place some petroleum jelly, have good isolation. And then patients um, will sometimes frequently report a temporary altered taste, right? Similar to like a metallic taste due to the silver in the product. All right, so we've talked a little bit about silver diamine fluoride, what it is, when it's indicated, mechanism of action, what's some treatment considerations. You know, we talked about the side effects, how it can potentially alter the taste, how it can stain the infected and affected dentin. So a study this month in JADA, the Journal of American Dental Association, actually surveyed some parents, okay, to determine what the parents' thoughts were on the staining that occurs after silver diamine fluoride is applied to those areas, those carious lesions. And they wanted to know what the parents thought about that black color that occurs from that staining process. So they basically surveyed about 120 parents. And the interesting thing about this was they showed them pictures, right, of what this stuff does to the teeth. And then they asked them if they would be okay with their child being treated with silver diamine fluoride. And what they found was is that some of the parents the aesthetic concerns of that staining, they found that absolutely unacceptable and would not approve that to be used in their children. And basically it was like 31% when uh, they were asked said absolutely not if it's going to be used in the posterior teeth. All right, And then if it was going to be used in the anterior teeth in the front and the smile zone, about 40% said absolutely not, will not agree to this being used on my child. So in general, the majority of the parents who did say it was okay to use silver diamine fluoride as a treatment option, they found that it was more acceptable to use it in the posterior region compared to the anterior region. And many of the parents who said, you know, absolutely not, I would not agree to this being used on my child due to the staining. Um, interestingly enough, if the child had to have a more invasive alternative treatment, like they had to be sedated or they had to go to the OR and receive general anesthesia due to the behavior reasons. Interestingly enough, a lot of the parents were more accepting of the staining 
in those situations if it meant their child had to undergo that, that other alternative, that more invasive, more risky procedure. So one of the big lessons that I took away from this article is that if you're going to use silver diamine fluoride as a treatment option, you should spend a lot of time making sure that the, the parent of the child you're going to treat, or if it's an adult, you should make sure that patient understands and that they're well informed on the benefits of silver diamine fluoride, but they should also be well informed on the side effects, namely the staining and the aesthetic concerns that can happen with the teeth. And the article actually recommended that you show the patient and show the parent before and after photos of that staining so they can have a visual and it helps them fully understand what you're talking about in regards to that staining. So the last thing I was going to talk about is if you do this on a patient, what are some of the CDT codes that you could actually use for this procedure? And one big thing you need to do is you need to check with your coding and your insurance advisors to make sure that they allow you to use these codes or at least give you some more information on maybe which codes would be more appropriate. So some of the codes that you could potentially use, uh, D1208, which is a fluoride application. Okay, that's something you could potentially use for any fluoride application. But because silver diamine fluoride does contain fluoride, you could use that code. Um, D9910, which is application of a desensitizing medicament. Certainly, if you're going to use silver diamine fluoride as a dentin hypersensitivity treatment, you know that's going to be an appropriate code to use for that. Um, the last code that you could potentially use is D1354, which is um, interim application of a caries arresting medicament. And that one's really more for the off-label use of silver diamine fluoride for that caries arresting feature. But that would be a great code to use if you're using it for that very purpose. So that was my overview of silver diamine fluoride. Um, I do want to take a little bit of time and just give a very big thank you to Elevate Oral Care, who I contacted in preparation for this. And they were amazing. They gave me some free samples of their Unidose um, Silver Diamond Fluoride. They provided me with a lot of information slides that you're actually seeing in this presentation. And they were just awesome. You know, some of the companies I contact to try to get more information on their products. Some you really have to kind of dig things out of them. This company was amazing. They sent me everything. Like less than 12 hours, I had a reply from them. And they said, here's this stuff. You use it as you wish. So I want to give a huge thank you to them. And again, I have no affiliation with them. I'm just a dentist. I don't have any reason to make money off this or anything like that from that company. I literally just reviewed the product. So hope you guys enjoyed that. And thank you, Elevate Oral Care, for helping me out. So, do you use silver diamine fluoride? And if so, I'd like to know what your experience with the product is. Please put your comments down below.